All right, well, welcome. As we continue on with chapter 15, we're gonna be looking more at equilibrium and equilibrium constants and some of the calculations involved with them, as well as a little bit of the meaning. As a part of this, there's a couple of times where I'm gonna ask you to go ahead and pause and work through a problem or two. So the overall time that it's gonna to take to do this should take longer than the actual um, recording has on there. Now, I, one of the things that we need to be able to do is to determine the value of K. Now, if, this is easy if we can measure lots of things. Uh, for example, here is an example. Uh, you know, we have the reaction that you see here and if two moles of an OCL is added to a one liter flask, at the equilibrium, the concentration is found to be 0.66 moles per liter. What is the value of K? So we're gonna use our ice table again to be able to work through this, okay? So remember, here's our reaction. We have our initial, our change in equilibrium. And we know that we start with two moles in a one liter flask. So this is gonna give us a two molar concentration here. And we know equilibrium concentrations of NO. So let's see what we get when we put that in there, okay? Um, I know that if NO is 0.66 at equilibrium and it starts out with nothing, we're going to end up with 0.66. And I also know that chlorine, since the stoichiometric ratio is two NOs to one Cl2, is going to be half of that. Now, since NO starts at zero, ends at 0.66, we know this is a positive. So the change has to be a negative on this side. Okay, so note the reaction stoichiometry is important here. And then we can get the equilibrium values of all three substances, putting that into our K equation, we get our equilibrium constant of 0 0.080. Now this is a relatively simple thing to do, but it requires us to understand what's going on in the ice table. The initial concentrations, if we're not given, generally are assumed to be zero. Now make sure you read the problem correctly because sometimes they're not always zero, okay? The change is gonna be what change occurs. And usually you're gonna be given one. Now, if you know one change using stoichiometry, you can find the change for everything else. And finally, equilibrium values are what we're gonna place into our equilibrium constant to do the calculations. Now there's times when you're gonna have unknowns involved. And when you have unknowns involved, then we start putting variables in there and one of the problems with variables is sometimes you end up with a quadratic equation. So we're gonna do a quick review of quadratic equations, okay? Um, now, here is a simple quadratic equation, 2x squared plus 4x equals one. And I want you to pause the video and find the values that satisfy this equation, okay? So again, pause the video. So when you solve it, you should come up with two values, x equals 0.2247 and x equals negative 2.225. Now, these values are both solutions to this. We need to pay attention to the fact that we get two solutions from the quadratic equation, but sometimes they're both, uh, you know, one of them doesn't make sense chemically. So we'll be able to eliminate one of them. Okay, now let's take a look at an example where you need to use the quadratic equation. Okay, so here I have equilibrium concentrations from K, all right? This is the reaction given N2O4 gas uh, is in equilibrium with two NO2 gas. Now, if we start with N2O4 of 0 0.50 molar, which means that there's no NO2 initially, what are the equilibrium concentrations? Well, we're gonna start out by writing our K equation. And in this particular case, at the temperature given, we have the value of K, okay? So now we need to start looking at a rice table or an ice table. Now this uh, um, R-I-C-E, I've been listening to Dr. Hushka too much. I call it a rice table now. Um, if I take a look at this reaction, my initial values of N2O4 are 0 0.50 and NO2 is zero. Now what change is going to occur? Right, we don't know, so we're gonna call that x or 2x, okay? Now, generally speaking, if our coefficient is one, we're gonna call it x. If our coefficient is two, we're gonna call it 2x. If our coefficient is three, it would be 3x. 
our coefficient is 74, it'd be a really weird reaction, but we would call it 74x. That's what we're going to use. We're going to use that coefficient with it. And how do I know that this one is going to decrease? Well, I know with NO2, this value of zero means it can't go down. It has to go up. So this one has to be positive. If we didn't have that, we would have to calculate Q to figure out which side was positive and which side is negative. And when we combine our initial and our change, we get our equilibrium values that you see here, 0.5 minus X and 2X. Now, when I put this in here, the N204, N204 down here is going to be 0.50 minus X. The 2X is going to be a 2X, which is going to be squared. So this is going to give me 4X squared here at 0.5 minus X at equals 0.059. Now I can simplify that. Um, I'll let you work through that step if you want to. But when we simplify it, we end up with the quadratic equation 4x squared plus 0.0059x minus 0.0030 equals zero. And in order to do this, you need to use the quadratic equation. So I want you to pause the video here, go ahead and solve this using the quadratic equation, and then we'll see how you did on it. Okay, so uh, going through the solution of it now, hopefully you've paused it and gone through this. Here is our quadratic equation, negative B plus or minus B squared minus 4AC, notice C is a negative value here, all over 2A. And this gives us uh, two different values when we solve it, X equals 0.027 or X equals negative 0.028. Now, the negative value doesn't have any real meaning because this would give us a negative concentration of our NO2. That doesn't make any sense. So this doesn't contribute to our solution. The X equals 0.027 does. And when we go back to our equilibrium values, the N204 is equal to 0.57 minus X. That gives us 0.47. The NO2 is 2X which is 0.054. And if I want to, I can put that back in my equilibrium expression and solve for my equilibrium value again. Okay. Now the results are in agreement with a magnitude of K. Now uh, this is reaction favored or reactant favored due to the small value of K. Remember the K is less than one. So we would expect to have more reactants than we would products. Now, there are some times where even though we could use a quadratic equation, we're going to simplify something. Now, it turns out that when, if I take my constant times 100 is less than the initial concentration, I can make an assumption, okay? I can assume that this A0 minus X, my initial concentration, isn't significantly changed when I take X out of it. So it's not significant. So I'm going to make an approximation. See if I can talk right. I'm going to make the approximation that this minus X is negligible and just put A0 minus X as A0. Okay, so we'll see how this is going to work out. So let's look at a problem. Now, in this case, if I increase the concentration of N204 to one molar, I'm going to find out something. Now with K is 0.0059, K times 100 is 0.59, which is still less than one, which is my initial concentration. Now this one's kind of on the borderline, but we're gonna see that it'll work out quite well here. So if you wanna take a look at the reaction, uh, we're gonna solve for um, equilibrium concentration using the quadratic equation. You're welcome to do that. Go ahead and pause the video and solve that using the quadratic equation or you can just keep watching. So solving the quadratic equation, we get X equals 0.038 molar. Um, so this gives us the N204 concentration of 0.096 and the N20 of 0.076. But let's take a look at what happens if we work this a little bit differently, okay? So using our ice table here, um, my initial concentration is one, the NO2 is zero. I, again, I'm going to have my change, and this is going to increase by 2x, and this is going to be minus x. But for our equilibrium value, I'm going to ignore this minus x. I'm going to make that approximation and just call it 1. And that's going to be uh, 2x for our NO2. 
So when I solve this for my K expression, I'm gonna end up with my product squared, which is two X squared. Don't forget to square the two. Most common mistake that people make. They see a number in here, they see an exponent and they write two X squared down here. No, that two is within the um, expression that is raised to the second power. My one, 1 1.00, but I just made it easy to see here and equals 0 0.0059. So when I solve this, I end up with x equals 0 0.038, which is the same as when I solved it using a quadratic equation. So I can use this approximation as long as k times 100 is greater than our concentration, okay? Uh, it very often is used. I won't say it's always used, you need to check and see whether it's a, a simplification or an approximation that we can use. All right, so just to remember, if we're calculating concentrations, there's an overall process we're gonna do. We need to start out with a balanced equation. If you don't have a balanced equation, we can't do anything with equilibrium. So you need to have your balanced equilibrium expression. And then you need to calculate Q. Now, if either of your products or reactants have zero concentration, then we don't need to calculate Q. We know Q is either going to be, if you have a reactant that is zero, well, okay, you're gonna have something over zero, which is gonna be undefined, and we're not gonna be able to use that. Um, but if we have a Q, where a product is zero, that's gonna give us Q is zero. That's obviously gonna be smaller than our uh, value of K, but otherwise we're gonna get a number for Q and we're gonna compare Q to K. If Q is greater than K, that means I have more products. So my products are gonna be negative. If Q is less than K, I have more reactants. So my reactants are gonna be the negative value. And then we're going to start by writing down the initial concentrations. Don't forget the ones that are zero. And if we happen to know any equilibrium concentrations, we're going to write those down. Sometimes we don't. And then we remember initial plus change gives us equilibrium. Once we have something in each of the equilibrium boxes, we can put it into our equilibrium expression and solve it. Okay, so here's another example. Okay. At elevated temperatures, iodine molecules break apart to give iodine atoms, according to the equation that you see here. Now, if Kc for this reaction is 3.39 times 10 to the negative 12. Now, notice, really small number here. Okay, So if I take K times 100, uh, even with these really small concentrations here, um, that's going to be a very small value. So if I put atomic iodine if a one liter vessel with 0 0.00155 moles of iodine, what are gonna be the equilibrium concentrations, okay? So we're gonna set this up using an ice table, okay? And it looks like it was going to be another quadratic, but again, remember, that's a really small value. K uh, times 100 is gonna be significantly less than our concentration. So you won't have to use that. So when K is small, the solution can be often simplified, okay? Now, I left you for that, uh, that problem for you to work for your own practice. Uh, we're gonna go ahead and move on here. Now, uh, there are some times where you have easy problems where you're gonna have a square on both sides and you'll be able to take the square root of that. Uh, there's gonna be hard problems that no matter what you do, K is going to be greater than one. We tend to see, oh my, I have to do a quadratic equation with that. Yes, be prepared to use the quadratic equation. And you're wondering, would I give you a problem on the test where you have to do the quadratic equation? If you remember what I said of asking the question, would he do that? Of course he would. Will he? I don't know. You should probably check on each and every problem and find out. Okay. Now there are also easier problems where you can use an approximation. We're going to try to limit most of our applications of equilibria to those where we can do some kind of a simplification for very simple systems, especially because we're just introducing equilibrium in this. Okay, now uh, another thing we want to look at is if our k is really small, 
uh, we can find the equilibrium from the initial concentrations there. Uh, here's another example that we're looking with. So how, how are we going to solve this? Now, again, I'm concerned with what procedure we're going to have. Remember, write a balanced equation. Oh, got it. It's right there. It's really nice when it's given to you. Okay, so we're going to set up our ice table now. We have our equation. We have our ice table. And then we're going to substitute the expressions for the equilibrium concentrations into the equilibrium expression. Okay, and the equation can be solved using the quadratic equation, but since k is small, x can be ignored. And you can check your approximation, which should be within 5%. Okay, so let's go back and look at that here real quick. Uh, so when I do my ice table, notice I, initial concentration, is 0.5 liters contains 0.0125 moles. So don't forget, 0.0125 moles is not the concentration. The concentration is moles per liter, so 0.0125 over liter. That's my initial concentration of H2S. My initial concentrations of H2 and S2 are going to be zero. And when I look at these, both of these are going to be zero. So my products are going to be positive. This is the S2 is going to be a plus X. H2 is plus 2X. And the H2S is minus 2X. And this is how we're going to be able to solve it with our ice table. I will leave that for you to do on your own. Now, when we're calculating concentrations, again, we're going to do the same thing. We're going to write a balanced equation. We're going to calculate Q. We're going to tabulate our initial concentrations uh, and put our known equilibrium concentrations in there. And then we can use um, concentration uh, calculations with stoichiometry. This is all really simple stuff, which means that where you're going to get caught is in the details. Okay, so the overall process isn't super difficult. Make sure you keep track of the details. Now, one of the details that we're going to have is we're going to be able to manipulate equilibrium constants. Now, when we start taking a look at the value of K, it's going to tell us something, but we can also look at combinations of different equations or what happens when we combine two equations into one or if I multiply by something, or if I divide by something, what effect is that going to have on our equilibrium constant? So we're going to take a little bit of time and realize that the value of K depends on the way equi the equation is written. Now notice, if I have an equilibrium, I have a reactant and a product, and they're a forward and a reverse reaction. I could have written it the other way around. If I write it the other way around, uh, it's going to give me a different equilibrium constant. Okay, uh, the equilibrium concentrations are going to be important. They're going to be the same no matter how the, how the equation is written. So let's take a look at a couple of things that we can do. One of the things we can do is multiply the coefficients of the reaction. Okay, so if we take uh, the reaction S plus 3 halves O2 gives us SO3, I know you don't like fractions. So let's multiply everything by 2. So we multiply and now we have whole numbers and we don't have to work with fractions, especially because this is very likely to give us a quadratic equation. Uh, but if we're given our K for the first overall reaction, uh, the K2 is gonna be equal to that squared. So I don't need to go through and do a lot. I just know I multiplied the reaction by two, I square the K, I've got it. Now, if I multiply by a value other than two, I would take it to the value of N. Okay. If I reverse a reaction, now notice this reaction could be written either way, and I can write K for the first reaction or K for the second reaction, which is equal to the inverse. Okay. So if I reverse a reaction, K is the inverse of. Finally, I can combine two different equations. Now, if I combine two equations to get an overall reaction, I'm going to do the same thing with the equilibrium constant. But whereas I add the reactions, I'm going to multiply the constants. So if I have two reactions that are added together, K, the new constant is going to be the multiplied constants of the previous one. So the new equilibrium constant is a product of the individual equilibrium constants. There's a lot of situations where this is going to be a very important aspect for us. All right. Now, 
let's move on and let's talk about one last thing in this chapter. And then we'll be able to uh, use our generic equilibrium expressions, work on this homework, and be ready for next week when we start a very important application of this. Now, the last thing we're gonna look at is Le Chatelier's principle. Now, I mentioned this in lecture on Wednesday, but I wanna readdress this just a little bit. Now, Le Chatelier's principle is often stated as, if an outside influence upsets an equilibrium, the system undergoes a change in a direction that counteracts the disturbing influence, and if possible, returns the system to equilibrium, okay? So in other words, if we change the conditions of a system at equilibrium, the reaction will proceed in a way to reestablish equilibrium. Okay, Linus Pauling said, if the conditions of a system initially at equilibrium are changed, the equilibrium will shift in such a direction as to tend to restore the initial conditions. Okay, this is a, a lot of words. In reality, Le Chatelier's principle is really simple. Again, something really simple, that means you can easily mess it up, but if you pay attention, you'll be able to follow this, okay? So what are the different ways that we can do it? We can change the temperature and we need to pay attention to uh, the enthalpy change for the reaction because if it's exothermic, we can treat heat as a product. If it's endothermic, we can treat heat as a reactant. We can change the concentration of a reactant either by increasing it or decreasing it or adding one of the reactants without changing the amount of uh, changing the size of the vessel that's still going to change the concentration or we can change the volume or similar ch similarly change the pressure for systems involving gases now if you change the volume of the container a liquid is in the liquid is not going to actually change in volume but if you add water to it, it will change in volume, uh, but that's gonna change the concentration. So unless we're working with gases, we're really not gonna work at, uh, look at the change in volume. Now, if a change of any of these factors occur, it's gonna cause the system at equilibrium to make a shift. And we often talk about shifting towards the products or shifting towards the reactants, or as the reaction is written, shifting to the right or shifting to the left. Let's keep it simple and call it right or left. Okay, so let's take a look at a couple um, examples. Temperature, if I have an exothermic reaction and I add heat, it's gonna shift away from the heat. So it would shift to the left. If I increase the temperature of an endothermic reaction, the endothermic reaction indicates that temperature is a reactant. So I'm gonna be adding more reactant. It's gonna shift the equilibrium to the right. For concentration, if I add a reactant, it's gonna to shift towards the products. If I add a product, it shifts towards the reactants. Now, what if I remove something? If I remove a product, okay, the product is gonna go down to reestablish equilibrium. It's gonna to shift to the right. And a volume change. And we talked about KP and KC in class. Just realize that it's gonna shift to reduce the pressure. Now, if I have an increase in pressure, it's gonna shift to the side that has fewer moles, okay? Now that doesn't always happen. Sometimes they have the same number of moles on each side. And realize that if I just add argon to it to change the pressure of the system, but I don't change the partial pressure, it has no effect on the system. All right. So again, increase in pressure, the equilibrium shifts to the side with fewer moles of gaseous reactants or products. If I decrease, it's going to shift to those with more. Okay. All right. Well, hopefully this is going to help you to understand everything in chapter 15. I want you to spend a significant amount of time working on the homework. I will give a few minutes in class on Monday to answer any questions, and we'll also spend part of our problem session answering questions on this. We're going to spend part of our problem session looking at a particular type of equilibrium problems. So with that, uh, hopefully this has helped you to understand chapter 15. I hope you enjoy your little bit of a break in here and I will see you next week.